Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sydney Van Zandt. I'll be speaking sometime next month, I think, on Haley Farm and Bluff Point. I was the founder of one of the founders and president of the Groton Open Space Association, who fought the battles that raised the funds to buy Haley Farm. I'm here today as a member of Groton Open Space Association, which is a friend of Haley Farm, friend of the state parks. And we are starting a special effort, and hopefully you will join us, because the funds for the DE, from the DEP or from the, from the legislature have been cut so very seriously. And all of us wish to have the parks that we care about cared for, but when the, the fine people that are, are taking care of it, namely John Lincoln for all these years, he has only one full-time helper for 18 parks. And then comes summertime, there are some part-time helpers. They need to be trained by the full-time helpers, as well as cutting lawns, taking care of, of the uh, uh, parks that have buildings on them. Haley Farm doesn't happen to have that. One of my hats that I've been wearing recently is that I would love to have an outhouse for the Haley Farm. <laughs> we have two for Bluff Point. We have none for Haley Farm. But even with the two, John and his one full-time person and few part-time people are the ones that take care of all that. So we need a lot of calls to our legislators to say that more funding is needed to help the park supervisors take care of what we have. John, here you go. Well, thank you. I guess you're attached. Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of my hobbies is genealogy, and I've traced my, uh, one of my ancestors back to Groton in 1635. So it's really a pleasure to be here to help celebrate uh, Groton's 300th. Um, we're here to talk about Fort Griswold. I've uh, been involved at Fort Griswold since 1979 when I uh, worked as a, a summer employee there, uh, mowing lawns and things like that. I've done just about every job there is to do on the park, so I can literally say I, I know every inch of the park. Uh, I've been the park supervisor there since 1985. I lived on the park from 1985 to 1998. So uh, it's a, a real uh, jewel for the state of Connecticut. Uh, probably the most important thing I could tell you today is that it's one of the best extant remains of a Revolutionary War fort that there is. So that makes it very significant for Connecticut and something we should all be proud of. Um, the talk today is kind of going to cover from the Revolutionary War up to present day. I've got images, uh, some are copies of maps from 1776 and some are photographs that I took yesterday. So you'll kind of get the full uh, broad spectrum. Uh, back uh, just after Lexington and Concord, uh, it, it, uh, the Governor's Council of Safety decided that uh, there was a need to fortify the harbor of New London. Uh, prior to 1775, the f fortifications, if you would call them that, in the area were nothing more than houses that were fortified. And mostly, uh, uh, they weren't afraid of a threat of, uh, from a foreign country. It was, it was more just a place of refuge if they were under attack from, from Native Americans or any other uh, threat locally. Um, at any rate, in 1775, they decided to uh, create forts uh, to protect New London Harbor. They chose the height on, uh, on Groton side to locate Fort Griswold, which was named after Deputy Governor Matthew Griswold. And they chose a point of land on the New London side to, uh, to cite Fort Trumbull, which was named after uh, Colonial Governor Jonathan Trumbull. The forts are exactly one mile apart. Uh, so really, they, they, one of the things they looked at was the overlapping firepower that the forts could afford to protect the harbor. So really, the, the guns that each fort had had a, had a pretty accurate range of a little over half a mile to be able to overlap and cover the harbor. New London was a very successful privateering port during the Revolutionary War. Privateers were licensed, armed, 
ships, privately owned, that would go out and capture British shipping, uh, then on its way to British-held New York. Uh, they were very successful. Um, they were a real thorn in the British side. During the summer of 1781, they captured the Hannah, which was valued at 30,000 pounds sterling. We have one of the uh, fans uh, that was on that ship, the Hannah, uh, in our Monument House Museum. Um, when they would bring a prize ship in, they would fire three cannon shot, which was generally good news. Uh, everybody would do well by bringing in a prize ship. The warehouses would be full, the crew would get paid, the owners of the ship would get paid. It was generally good news. But in 1775, they, they located uh, Fort Griswold on the Groton side. And this is a 1776 map of the harbor. Fort Trumbull over in this area here. Fort Griswold on the other side. And this was the first fortification that was built at Fort Griswold. A river battery following the natural configuration of the land. Now this is where our present river battery is now. And this was called the covered way. It was really a ditch that they could get up and out of the harm's way. It didn't have a top on it, but it was really a ditch lined with stone walls. They could duck down and protect themselves from enemy fire. Up at the top here, behind the, the ledge, this went up around the ledge, this was the barracks. So many people don't know that, that the river battery and the covered way actually predate the fort. So that was the first thing there, and then after that they constructed the fort. Some of the features, I know, I realize it's hard to read, but the, the magazine was in this area here. Here's the covered way that came up behind the ledge. This structure, this V out in the front, was called a ravelin. And each one of these little triangles here is a gun embrasure. And this line, this uh, rectangle right here was the barracks. And here was the well. So it was pretty well uh, self-sufficient. Uh, self uh, and, and it was entirely manned by, by militia and locals. Uh, there was no continental army here. Um, the most significant thing to happen on the property was September 6, 1781, I'm sure all you know, the Battle of Groton Heights and the burning of New London. The idea was that Benedict Arnold would uh, make a surprise attack. Um, during the summer of 1781, at, after they captured the Hannah, Rivington's Royal Gazette, which was a loyalist newspaper published in New Jersey, referred to New London as the Magazine of America and as the most detestable nest of pirates on the continent. So those are pretty, pretty strong words for, for back then. Um, many people feel that the battle took place as a revenge for the, uh, the privateers. Um, or uh, at that time, this was one month before the surrender at Yorktown, so this was the end of the Revolutionary War. And some people feel that it may have been a, a diversionary tactic to try to divert Washington, who was then marching south towards Yorktown. The idea uh, that what Benedict Arnold had turned about a year before, and he was put in charge of this expedition. He, the idea of the attack was to come in at night on an onshore breeze, disable the forts, destroy the rebel fleet, and then in the middle of the night in early September, the breeze would change to an offshore breeze and they would be able to just sail right out. Well, the breeze changed much earlier than they thought, and the, the 35 or so British ships got stuck out off the mouth of the harbor. When they uh, uh, were seen by the, uh, by the locals, an alarm was sounded. Now, the alarm for an attack was two cannon. Colonel William Ledger was in charge of the harbor's defenses. He was in charge of Fort Griswold, he was in charge of Fort Trumbull, and he was in charge of Fort Nonsense. Fort Nonsense was a, a, a fortification that was up uh, uh, near Montauk Avenue, New London. It had no range to any water body, and so the locals called it Fort Nonsense or Fort Folly. It was probably one of the leftovers from a fortified house from before the construction of Fort Griswold and Fort Trumbull. Colonel William Ledger ordered the, the Fort Griswold to fire the two shots. 
Benedict Arnold, knowing the signals, uh, real, realized that he was from Norwich, just up the river, fired a third shot, which to the surrounding countryside was actually kind of good news. Uh, three shots, remember, was a, a signal that they were bringing a prize uh, ship in from a, from a privateer. So they again fired the two shots, and Benedict Arnold fired a third, confusing the, the signal. Because they couldn't get the British ships up into the river, they were against the wind and against the tide. They disembarked down at the mouth of the harbor, uh, roughly Ocean Beach on the New London side, about 800 troops, and Avery Point on the Groton side, about 800 troops. Uh, they then proceeded to march up towards the forts. Fort Trumbull was really just a three-sided river battery uh, on the New London side, and not well defended from its landward side. Because the British were approaching from the land, Captain Adam Shapley and the 30 or so defenders of Fort Trumbull fired one volley at the approaching British and then got into boats and went over to help defend Fort Griswold. So a lot of the uh, defenders at Fort Griswold originally came from Fort Trumbull. There was roughly 165 uh, men, in, uh, men and boys in Fort Griswold when it was attacked by the 800 British. So they were outnumbered, close seven or eight to one. There was demands for surrender, which were refused. The second demand for surrender came with a threat that the defenders would be given no quarter. In other words, if they were captured, they wouldn't be treated very well. The response from Colonel Ledyard was, let the consequences be what they may. We will not give up the fort. With that, another attack by the British took place. And at this time, it was just uh, uh, men in arms. There was no British artillery up near the fort at that time. So the fort was able to hold its own fairly well. And a stray shot dro uh, dropped the colors. The flag dropped from uh, its halyard being cut. It was quickly remounted on a pike pole. But a lot of the British took that as a, a surrender and came charging over, only to be repulsed again. Um, Three of the British uh, uh, commanders were, were, were killed in the, in the attack. Um, and there was roughly 50 or so British uh, killed at that point. Then just by sheer numbers, the British gained entrance to the fort. Colonel Ledyard handed his sword in surrender, was run through with his own sword, and a massacre ensued. About 88 of the 165 or so defenders were killed. The following Sunday in church, there was only one male present, and he was too old to have fought in the battle. Um, at that point, I'd like to, to pause. We have some reenactors here in attendance. And um, I, mean, I could talk an hour just solely on the Battle of Groton Heights, or, or maybe even that long just on Benedict Arnold. But uh, we are covering the whole uh, you know, history of the park. So, but at this point, I'd like to pause, and, and we've got some things uh, we'd like to show. Everyone? Well, you wanted to get your stuff to show them, or you want to just explain what maybe what you're wearing and. Uh... Um, what I am is um, part of a regimental group of a Revolutionary War living history group that we belong to. Uh, I serve in a position as a fist staff member. I accompany our regiment um, solely because I'm able to cook. I can provide nursing care. I can provide being the laundress. Um, General Washington usually discouraged most families to accompany uh, General Washington usually um, discouraged women to be accompanying their husbands in battle, mainly because it slowed down everything. It also caused rifts between the old old age thing of people, the, the gentlemen who would have a spouse there and the single soldiers that wouldn't. So General Washington usually always favored women that were of a large stature who would not be very beautiful so that men would be discouraged for giving them their attention. I am dressed today in what would be a polonaise gown. Um, it is not everyday wear. It's one of my finer dresses that I own. A woman, if she had one fine dress like this, this would have probably have been my wedding dress. Um, and it is, you know, a polonaise where it's a double layer and has a ruffle. It's 
um, boned down the front here, and we have pockets. Women nowadays carry pocket books, but I have two pocket books on today. My pocket books are down here in my slits of my skirts. And a woman, since mine were hidden, means that I am married. If I were a young woman or a young girl, I would have ones hanging outside of my dress and they would be all finely embroidered, showing my skills of housemaking and domesticity. And I'll turn it over to okay. Corporal Whitney. You'll have to talk because okay. my, my hands are oh. literally full. Okay, this is the uniform of 2nd Continental Light Dragoons, a uh, regiment that was established under the uh, congressional orders and uh, funding. It wasn't a state-raised regiment, although it was raised in the state of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. The only dragoons you would have seen at Fort Griswold were couriers and messengers going through along the coast road carrying messages from Washington to Rochambeau or the other American commanders up in Rhode Island area. And just to quickly spin through this, as opposed to the regular length musket, they carried a carbine length musket. The main difference being that it could be, if I can find the right clip, carried on horseback, fired, clipped, and then dropped, and then they could go to the, the, the weapon that they could always rely on to work, which was the saber. So, but because dragoons could fight mounted and dismounted, they also carried a bayonet that would fit on the musket. Now, being shorter than the, mus the musket carried by the British soldiers, it wasn't a good deal to go up a bayonet to bayonet, but if you had the bayonet, you had a chance Whereas if you had a rifle that didn't mount it, you had no chance against the musket. Now, it's simple enough what you would have seen at the fort would have been civilians that they would not have had the fancy headgear. I can lose those too. They wouldn't have had the carbine sling that, hold on chair, that would support that. They wouldn't, have they wouldn't have carried a saber either. The riding gauntlets, the army could barely afford weapons and food. The gauntlets would not have been there. The coat, the regimental coats wouldn't have been worn either. So all you would have ended up with would have been, they would have had a cartridge box on their side and their musket, if they had a musket, or a light fowling piece, which was like a, a bird hunting shotgun. And that's all they would have had to, uh, for, for the home guard, for the civilians manning Fort Griswold. Thank you very much. Okay. After the battle, uh, the, uh, the ones that who, who were uh, taken prisoner were loaded on an artillery wagon to be taken down the hill to the landing at the foot of Fort Street to be taken prisoner. By then, they were able to get some British ships up into the river. They were loaded on an artillery wagon, and there's two versions to this. Either, either the artillery wagon uh, chain broke and, and got away from them, or it was let go down the hill. But it, uh, the artillery wagon went out of control with about 30 or so uh, prisoners on board and crashed into some apple trees. Um, Francis Manwaring Calkins, History of New London, uh, quotes that uh, the shrieks could be heard in New London when that wagon crashed. Um, the wounded were taken to the nearest house, which happened to be the house of Ensign Ebenezer Avery, um, where many of them spent the night without any relief, uh, and the next morning were cared for. Uh, and a lot, a lot of them uh, didn't make it through the night. The Ebenezer Avery House is now located on the grounds of Fort Griswold State Park. Following the Revolutionary War, uh, President Washington asked Congress for funds to re refortify all their coastal defenses. Uh, they did a significant uh, 
rebuilding of Fort Trumbull in New London. And they did quite a bit of, uh, of rebuilding of Fort Grizzled as well. You can see a different configuration of buildings here. They also dug a ditch around the, the uh, western side of the fort, on the water, water side of the fort. That wasn't uh, there in the Revolutionary War. But here you can really get a feel for how the fortifications came out around the Ravelin. A lot of people uh, see this Ravelin and don't really understand what its function was uh, as it looks today. But its function was to protect the gate so the enemy couldn't pull their cannon up to their gate and just blast away. So uh, these uh, projections here were called uh, abatis, which were like juniper branches and things tied together at one end with the points sticking out to slow down any enemy troop from uh, uh, approaching. Um, here again is another uh, uh, later work on the fort with the addition of these structures down at the bottom of the uh, covered way. Um, we suspect one of may have been a shot furnace, but we really don't know very much about them. Um, and then th that last one was in 1819. This is 1820. This was a plan for Fort Griswold in 1820. Uh, if it had been built, the, uh, the property would look a lot different than it does now. Um, in 1794, uh, uh, when they uh, reconfigured and added on to the fort, they also built a blockhouse, which was, uh, was located on the parade ground uh, inside, the, inside the fort. Um, you, can see, you can see it here, a square structure. They also built a blockhouse at Fort Trumbull. And the blockhouse at Fort Trumbull, we believe, is the, uh, the only one still in existence. Um, they were a square structure built of brick and stone and kind of a, 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 an area of last refuge used as a magazine and as, as barracks. And if you, if you go to Fort Griswold today, you can still see some signs of the foundation of the blockhouse that was in the middle of the fort. In 1826, they laid the cornerstone of the monument. And uh, it was funded by a lottery. And this is a copy of uh, one of the lottery tickets you could uh, buy for two dollars. And that's what funded the, uh, it, was, um, it was approved by the, the legislature, state legislature in Connecticut, and they built the monument. Um, it was, took four years to build. It's 120, it was 127 feet high when it was built, 26 feet square at the base and 12 feet square at the top. Uh, it was built all with granite quarried locally, just south of Fort Griswold. There's actually Granite Street. That's where all the it all came from. It was built by a center derrick uh, uh, means. And they would build a level, um, move the derrick up, build a level. So uh, lots of teams of oxen uh, to haul these huge granite blocks up there to build the monument. Um, the cornerstone was laid on September 6, 1826. And the monument was completed and dedicated on September 6, 1830. And here's an early photograph of the monument. A little hard to see, but you can see it has an open top. So originally, if you climbed to the top, 166 steps up to the top, you would just have a little railing around. <laughs> and I'm glad they, they closed it since then. Um, moving up to a later period, this is 1842. And this is the plans they had for the river battery. If you notice from the earlier uh, configurations, the the river battery followed the natural lay of the land. In 1842, they now implemented what they called the third system of coastal defense. And that's the same uh, kind of program that built the present Fort Trumbull in New London. Um, but they redid the river battery at Fort Griswold. And instead of having a, a zigzag shape, they straightened it out and kind of obliterated the southern half of the uh, the uh, western half of the covered way, and they made gun emplacements in a straight line. It held 24 and 32 pounders. Uh, back then they would uh, uh, describe a uh, cannon by the weight of the projectile. So the cannons that were on the river battery at Fort Griswold fired 24 pound balls and 32 pound balls. 
These are some of the 32 pounders that were there facing the river. Then in, uh, in 1867, they decided to upgrade all of the cannons. And the original gun emplacements, which you see here on the left, had a brick center and, and very um, minor amount of granite. And they upgraded them to the ones that you can see there today, which are all granite. Uh, the, the idea was to, uh, to mount 15-inch Rodman guns there. Um, actually, they had 8- uh, uh, and 10-inch Rodman guns they were going to mount, um, which were much he heavier. Uh, the, the barrel of a 32-pounder, um, we have two of them in existence over at the end of Monument Street at the entrance to Fort Griswold. Those barrels weigh 7,500 pounds. The 15-inch Rodman, which they proposed to, to mount at Fort Griswold, the barrels weighed 49,000 pounds. So quite a difference. That's why they had to go to a heavier base to be able to support them. <coughs> now, in this, uh, this is a, uh, a postcard of Fort Griswold. It, this is the 1843 powder magazine. Um, this was actually in 1876 uh, uh, when they were uh, getting ready to mount these 15-inch Rodman guns, these big heavy guns. They have three of them they brought and deposited there, although they never mounted them. Uh, and here's a whole stockpile of cannonballs and some of the carriages and, uh, and guns that they dismounted, uh, getting ready to, to mount these heavier ones. Um, we're kind of jumping around, but we're going chronologically, if you, if you bear with me. Uh, at the same time that the monument was built, the monument house right next to it was built. It was a small caretaker's house, and it had kind of a kitchen area, a sleeping area, and there was a caretaker who lived there who would go out and open the monument and allow the uh, people to climb it. In 1893, the Anna Warner Bailey chapter of the DAR was formed, and they met at the Bill Library next door. Their first regent was um, Abby Day Slocum, who lived at, uh, in a house called Daisy Crest right across from the park. It's now uh, a condominium house across from Bill Library, a big yellow uh, house there. And that's where she lived. And she approached the state after the caretaker moved out. He, uh, the caretaker moved into a house on Smith Street. And she approached the state about using the monument house as a place for visitors to the fort to rest. And uh, here's one of the, the earliest uh, photographs that we have of the interior of the monument house. Um, I think all of the DAR ladies at first had their own case. I know there was the, the Lucy Stanton Wheeler case uh, where we have, we have uh, copies of early inventories. And I think Lucy Stanton Wheeler outdid everybody else. She had all the best stuff in her case. Um, there's about 1,700 items now in the collection at the Monument House at Fort Griswold. Uh, and uh, most of it came from early members of the DAR. Here's another uh, view. Now, this is just the lower room. Uh, it, it, over in this area here, if, you've, if you go in the Monument House today, there's, there's an opening here up into the upper room of the, of the building. In 1906, uh, the DAR raised money to build what they called the Memorial Annex, the, the big upper room on the, on the Monument House Museum. Uh, and here, this is uh, Groton Heights School right next door. It's an early, uh, early photograph. This is the other side of the, of the structure. Um, there were some interesting artifacts that the DAR acquired. This is a Spanish-American War gun. It's actually a Spanish gun that was mounted on Admiral Cervera's flagship, uh, fired uh, the first shot of the Spanish-American War down in Santiago Harbor, uh, and it was given to the, to the DAR chapter and moved to Fort Griswold and located there. Um, Admiral George Dewey, I think, was a personal friend of uh, Mrs. Slocum, and I've seen some uh, references in the DAR uh, writings that uh, he had come and visited uh, Groton. Um, after the, the U.S. government moved out of Fort Griswold, they gave the Anna Warner Bailey chapter of the DAR 
four 32-pounder guns, four 8-inch smoothbore Rodman guns, one 24-pounder gun, two 15-inch Rodman smoothbore guns, 210-inch shot, 499 24-pounder shot, 310-inch shells, 682 32-pounder shells, and 168-inch shot. Now, what the DAR was going to do with all that, I don't know. <laughs> But what they ended up doing was, uh, was actually giving it to the Fort Griswold Tract Commission, which uh, oversaw the grounds of uh, Fort Griswold after the military left. And when uh, uh, the Fort Griswold Tract Commission then turned around and, uh, let me just find a figure here, they, they, uh, in World War II, later period, they, they donated uh, it as scrap uh, and it was 225,220 pounds of scrap, and, and they raised $711.14 towards the war effort. So all, the, all the, the gun tubes and cannonballs and all that you saw in the previous uh, image were all donated towards, towards the war effort. Uh, the bigger 15-inch Rodman guns, they had to dynamite them to get, out, get them off the property. Uh, my understanding of, through just talking to people is that it all ended up over in New London at Calamary's for a long period of time. Uh, and what they did after that, I don't know. But there are two that are remaining from Fort Griswold, and those are the two 32-pounders that are on either side of our memorial gates here. Uh, the memorial gates were uh, dedicated in 1911. Um, the only major kind of renovation to Fort Griswold took place between 1904 and 1911 and it culminated with uh, a dedication of the memorial gates and, and the wall that goes all the way up uh, Park Avenue and down Smith Street. So these two guns were originally on the river battery uh, down at the bottom of the hill and are, and are now still in this location here. Uh, here's an early photograph uh, from, from 1911. Um, and it's funny how everybody instinctively sits on the uh, sits on the cannon, as, just as they do today. Some things never change. A um, little bit hard to see, but this is a, a, an image of the dedication of the Memorial Gates in 1911. And uh, the only time we see crowds like this there today are during the fireworks. <laughs> um, here's another image with the great old, old cars on, on Park Avenue there in front of the monument. And this was the, uh, the old school here. Uh, Um, these were taken from uh, uh, a scrapbook that was uh, left, left to us by uh, the Hubbards. Guy and Rosman Hubbard owned this house, which is right across the field from the Monument House. The state purchased it in 1988, uh, and this scrapbook was left to us. Um, th these are September 6, 1931, all the bunting on the front of the house. Uh, one of the uh, cannons they used in a, in a reenactment they had. And I really don't know what this structure is. Maybe later afterwards somebody who knows could, could tell me. But uh, there's the river behind it. So this is right up on the southwest bastion of the fort. Uh, a couple of the, the neighbor uh, children there in front of it. Um, there's a little more of a close-up uh, of it. I don't know if it was uh, something left over from World War I. Um, the fort was occupied by the military from the Revolutionary War through World War II. So a, a long, long military history there. Uh, here's another 1931 image looking over towards the Monument House and the Monument. Um, this is actually an, an earlier image. This is where the, the Hubbard House would, would be. And the Hubbard House was started in 1912. And I think this is just prior to them building the, the Hubbard House. So you can really tell how the neighborhood is, uh, has changed. Is that from the top? Beg your pardon? Where's that picture taken from? It looks, it looks elevated. That was from the monument. Okay. This is, uh, uh, this is um, Smith Street right here. And EB would be over to the right. And um, I think this is Colonel Ledyard Cemetery up here. Is that where Colonel Ledyard is buried? Or is yes. He was originally, Colonel Ledger was originally buried in Ledger. Uh, then his body was exhumed and moved to Colonel Ledger Cemetery. Um, and here's, they, here's an image of, uh, of the fort, also I think 1931. And everything is so, uh, 
closely mowed. I don't know how they did it. They must have had sheep or something. I think I, I, think I need to look into getting a few of those. <laughs> Uh, here you can see the, the monument here. We have a marker where Major Montgomery was killed. That's still here to this day. Powder, powder magazine. Here's the entrance to the Sally Port, which is a tunnel that goes through the fort. Here's the marker where Colonel Ledger was killed. And here you can see uh, the outline of where the blockhouse was from the 1794, or the first system uh, structures. And here's the gate to the fort here. Uh, like I said, it's still uh, in, in in good shape uh, today, uh, even though our visitorship has, has gone up dramatically since 1931. You know, and here you can see really how EB, electric boat and all that, uh, has changed. Uh, there was a round house up here. I guess the, uh, they took all the railroad uh, cars across by ferry from, from up here. Um, so quite a, quite a change. This also is taken from the, from the monument. This, uh, some reenactors, I think that this is from a movie they made in 1976, I believe. But these are just a couple of images of some, some red coats I had to throw, it, throw in there uh, and firing the cannon up by the, the top of the fort. Um, now we'll get into some more modern day uh, images. These were uh, not, not too long ago. Um, one of the things in 1990, the, the park was renamed. Uh, to Fort Griswold Battlefield State Park. Um, I probably should back up that it uh, was under the Fort Griswold Tract Commission until 1954 when it was transferred to the State Park and Forest Commission, which was the predecessor to the current D, uh, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. And here's kind of what it looks, uh, looks like today. Um, in 2000, we did a, we received a grant from the American Battlefield Protection Program and uh, did a study, uh, a, a preservation, interpretation, and resource management plan. And one of the things they, they uh, recommended is that we only, uh, look, go back here. Um, One of the things they recommended is that we, uh, we not keep the ramparts of the fort closely cropped. Um, we've had people that would come and do their daily exercises jogging around the top of the fort, and it was really causing a lot of erosion problems. Um, and our, our obligation is to try to preserve it as best we can. So we, uh, we added some topsoil on the top and uh, fertilizer and things like that, uh, and put some signage up to uh, ask people not to walk around on the top. Um, and it seemed to help quite a bit. Uh, now there's grass established, whereas before we were really getting a, a gully from people walking around. This is the, uh, the river battery. Um, as I pointed out before, both of these structures were built in 1843. This is the uh, powder magazine, and this is the shot furnace. The shot furnace was designed to heat cannonball red hot. So if they were fired at a ship, they would set them ablaze. One of the most common questions I get is, how did they get the cannonball that's, that were red hot up into the guns? And my answer has always been very carefully. <laughs> uh, I think they had tongs that they would pick them up with. Here are the, uh, the gun emplacements that the, uh, the 24 and 32 pounder uh, guns were mounted on top of. You can see the, the rear these were called front pintle mounts, and they had uh, wheels on the rear track and wheels up on the front here. And here's another shot of the uh, shot furnace, which is really uh, uh, getting in tough shape right now. Um, but we're looking at different avenues of trying to get some funding to, uh, to do some restoration to it. Uh, many people haven't seen this. This is the interior of the powder magazine. And what it has is a wooden room inside a stone building uh, with air all around it so that you get a nice circulation of, of air to keep the powder dry. And that's what the interior looked like. In 1873, they built an ordinance sergeant's residence. Uh, by that point, um, Fort Griswold 
uh, the uh, soldiers there were, were, or Fort Griswold was kind of subservient under Fort Trumbull. Um, oddly enough, when they were first built in the Revolutionary War, um, Fort Griswold was the complete fort, the bigger fort. Fort Trumbull was just a battery. And then they kind of switched roles later on. And Fort Trumbull uh, was completely rebuilt and was the bigger fort. And the only thing they, the military used at Fort Griswold was the river battery. They had an ordnance sergeant who lived in this house. And uh, one of the things he had to do was grow vegetables out in the field, out in the front. So you can still see kind of a, a concave uh, uh, where they had plowed the field to, to grow corn and vegetables, which he had to grow for all the troops who were at Fort Trumbull. Here's the, uh, another image of the Spanish uh, gun that was given to the DAR. Um, that's sitting right down in front of the monument. And that's the Bill Library in the background. Another monument we have on the park uh, was dedicated, uh, uh, was erected by Robert Gray, who was the only uh, Groton resident to win the Con Congressional Medal of Honor. I think there are, are six of these uh, located around. Um, if anybody have any, any questions on these, Mr. Uh, Edward Hart is in the back here, and he, he, I'd consider him an ex expert on, <laughs> on those. Uh, here's the Ebenezer Avery House, which in 1971 was uh, dismantled completely and rebuilt on the park grounds. It's still operated by the and open to the public by the Ebenezer Avery Association. Um, and they, uh, they staff it and they open it on weekends in, in the summer. And then we have the uh, Trillium Garden Club takes care of the garden out in the front here, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, working through all our, our memorials we have on the property here, we have a freedom tree. Many people don't know that we, we have that there. It's located right between the Ordnance Sergeant's residence and the Avery House, uh, dedicated in 1974. And there's a picture of the tree. Uh, this is, of course, a wintertime uh, photograph. We also have the City of Groton's uh, uh, memorial to, uh, uh, to their war uh, veterans. Uh, and that's located right over in front of the... Uh, front of the monument. Um, these were taken last summer, just a couple of shots of uh, that's looking up at the fort from down at the bottom of the hill. And here's how our memorial gates appear today. And another shot of the monument from down at the bottom of the hill. I think these were a year old or so. Uh, we have our old uh, uh, flagpole here. We just dedicated uh, three new flagpoles with the help of the city of Groton and the Friends of Fort Griswold. And these pictures were taken yesterday and here, here are the three new <laughs> flagpoles. Uh, here's the interior of the Monument House, just a couple of, couple of shots. Uh, we have a portrait here of Mrs. Slocum. Uh, another shot looking the other way, very similar to view from the ones before. Um, some shots from yesterday of the Ordnance Sergeant's residence, the Ebenezer Avery House. 1979, we built a maintenance building, finally, on the property. Uh, we use that quite a bit today. We store, store things and work out of there when we're at the park. Uh, here's the, uh, we call this the Hubbard House. This is the house right across the field from the Monument House, which is part of the park. And these were from uh, Sunday. We had a, about 30 people there sledding down the hill. Very popular uh, spot for sledding. Uh, people on skis and sleds and tubes. And of course, uh, I lived in the, in the house uh, right over to the left of this picture. And uh, you know, people very often uh, come out in the middle of the night and sled. Of course, the park is closed. Um, but nobody can sled quietly. So many a time I would venture out there at 2 in the morning telling people to, uh, that they had to leave. Uh, this is our newest uh, addition to the park. This is down at the waterfront landing. Uh, we have a, a monument or memorial here. This is where they took the prisoners on board. Uh, after the Battle of Groton Heights. We now have a floating dock. Um, 
we're in the process of uh, establishing a water taxi that would take you from uh, the city pier across the river where the train station and the bus station and the parking garage is. Um, you could come over here to Fort, uh, Fort Griswold side. Uh, you could go to uh, Fort Trumbull. You could go up to the, the Nautilus. We're in the process of working to establish a floating dock up at the Nautilus. And you'd be able to go out to New London Ledge Light. So we think that'll be a very popular uh, uh, addition. Of course, the last time there was a water taxi operating was during op sale. And everybody got on the water taxi, but nobody wanted to get off. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll end with this. Here's my, my debut in the New London Day in 1985, about 20 years ago. And the caption I have under, that they put under my picture, much to my surprise, was, the biggest thing I'd like to see here is public restrooms. So, <laughs> well, I'm still here, and I'm still waiting. But um, no, the reason I bring that up, we are in the process of moving forward with uh, finally having public restrooms at Fort Griswold. And that's it. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. <laughs>